As Prudence said, I'm Tessa Smith with the Artisans Group and I'm a principal and architect with them and I have two uh, co-principals, Randy Foster and Rusa Cassell. I believe Rusa is on this call somewhere. And we are a small but mighty firm. We're women owned and women led and we work all over the Pacific Northwest. We have about eight to 10 employees, maybe a little bit less these days due to some layoffs, but we're working hard to minimize that. And we do a lot of projects in the Pacific Northwest and particularly this year and the year before we started to reach on a more national level um, into some other markets that are a good fit for us. So we're starting to work all over the country doing passive house focused work in, in a lot of states. The house I'm gonna talk about today is the Madison House. It's a small certified passive house that we built in a very urban lot in downtown Olympia. It's about as downtown as you can get before you start to get into large commercial lots and multifamily. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a really sweet little house. It, it had its challenges and certification just because it's small. And I know anyone who's done a small passive house has experienced some of those challenges. Uh, but, you know, one of our big focuses was how to put a house in an existing neighborhood. So even an eclectic neighborhood like this one in Olympia, there's always a degree of trauma when you develop an undeveloped lot. So we were really focused on the scale and keeping the scale small and trying to be respectful of, um, you know, uh, the neighborhood that already was there. Here's our tiny little footprint. It's about 1358 TFA. It's a two bedroom, two bath uh, with, with a pretty uh, substantially sized bike bedroom, as we coined. Uh, the uh, owners are some baby boomers that actually met bicycling and it's one of their passions. So that was a pretty big focus of the design the staging to be able to wash off bikes and put them away. And as you can see, it, there's, there's not a lot of fluff. It's pretty small and it's pretty straightforward in terms of the layout. Lots of storage though. Some of the salient points uh, for passive house nerds like ourselves is there's about six inches of foam under the slab. A lot of our work still tends to have that kind of slab and foam relationship, although we've definitely been able to achieve foam free in almost every other regard with most of our structures these days. Uh, the foam does tend to still be happening in the in the foundation and I, I know there's some fun stuff coming out. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to get away from that hopefully in the not too distant future. R41 in the walls, R80 in the ceiling. A Zender Novus. I think since we did this house, we've switched to the Paul, which I believe is more efficient. IntelliHawk Combi Unit, Zola Thermo Plus clad windows. Uh, and then we, we're in a climate zone four with about uh, 51 heating degree days, if that gives you a sense of our climate. Olympia proper actually gets about 15% less sun than Seattle. So that does create some challenges um, for, for modeling hyper-locally. We did certify this with FIAS, but uh, Mr. Schuyler, who did our energy modeling for us, there he is, uh, did uh, look at both certifications. <clears throat> Excuse me. We try to do that on uh, most of our work because we do tend to find weaknesses or shortcomings of the design when we model it in, in, um, with the expectation of certifying in either certification, PHI or FIAS. And so uh, this one we did certify with, with FIAS, but as you can see from the quote there from Skylar, we, with a few tweaks, we could have certified it through PHI as well. Here's the lot you can see in the top there. Uh, that's actually two lots. So this created an interesting uh, design constraint in that the lot is quite small, as you can see, uh, since it's just the lot to the left there. Uh, but it, its southern lot is going to be developed. There's no question about it, but we just don't know what's going to be put there, right? We don't know who's going to buy it or what they're going to build. So that became a focus that we'll get into in a moment. You can see the foam being laid around our foundation detail. You can see the sand, which you'll see in the next detail where they've trenched with even just their fingers for the plumbing and the electrical runs they want in the subfloor. So this is a detail that we've probably used on over 20 passive houses. Um, it's regionally speaking, it's, it's a good detail for us because we do live in a seismic zone. So there's some challenges in that you wanna move the seismic hold downs into the heated envelope of the building. Um, and then you also have to be able to build this detail in the wet. So we're able to lay the bottom phone, uh, form up for the footings, get the uh, sand in, and then it can sit and it can be as wet as we want it to be for as long as it needs to be. And then we can come in with the Visqueen and pour the slab on one good dry day. And uh, so in terms of sequencing, it's pretty powerful. Here's some pictures during construction. You can see the netting for the dense pack insulation. 
You can see some Intello that they're going to wrap around a detail there next to the OSB. This did have a hard lib, but we did use some Intello to solve a couple of tricky connections. And you can see the HRV uh, sort of uh, in its little sheet rocked nook that we created for it. So we'd only have to uh, install it once instead of dry fit it and then put it back in. We've done a ton of different walls at the artisans group on a ton of different kinds of passive houses. Um, this one, when we're doing a site built house, we've sort of settled on a two by eight with two by four staggered framing with uh, two to four inches of rigid insulation, either um, you know, the, the wood fiber or, um, you know, uh, for some of our earlier work, we did foam, but we've mostly gotten away from that. But these days we're actually doing mostly uh, prefab. So most of our custom homes are being built by Collective Carpentry. They have a couple of really fabulous foam free walls that I'm a big fan of. Uh, and they're just generally speaking, a really qualified and wonderful passive house company to work with. But this one was site built and we did use the uh, wall here that's circled in red. Here you can see some of its radiant qualities because this has become sort of um, our standard for when we're doing a site built uh, passive house wall in our region. We did have it thermally modeled by Skyler. And there he is again, look at that face. So this is a fun little detail on this project. Um, I feel like uh, with passive houses, you're always struggling with a couple things, you know, like the forehead of having a thick roof we're always struggling with porches and how they connect to the rest of the building. Um, you know, are you going to create a thermal bridge and do blocking? Are you, you know, how are you going to handle that? So on this particular house, because we had a full uh, porch that was wrapping around, we actually chose to hide uh, basically secondary posts that support the porch in um, a faux wall that essentially is just a deeper rain screen. So because you can't see that they're not in plane together from any real direction, uh, the siding covers it, you can't, you can't tell it's there, and we were able to separate the structures and bear the slab for the, uh, for the deck out here on this uninsulated slab and, and really keep them separate so there's no thermal bridging. In this house below on the bottom left, we actually chose to leave um, the structure exposed and did it with steel. So those are two different solutions that we've explored for two different passive houses. So like I said, we weren't sure what was going to be built to the south, and so that created some challenges for how we were going to articulate the building. We wanted to make it so that if someone built, since it is a small lot, in all likelihood a two-story structure, that we wouldn't lose all of the uh, solar exposure that's heating our building. So we articulated the great spaces and the sort of second height with the Claire story over to the north as far as we possibly could. This is also a fun little study I did with Evan at Zola Windows, who is another lovely person to work with if you're looking for a good window vendor. And he uh, worked this up for me. He, uh, me and him taught a class about how to design uh, windows inexpensively for passive houses. And of course the frame is expensive and the window is, the glass is not. Uh, you know, the, the glass is uh, the best performing part and the frame is the least performing part. So we're trying to always get the biggest opening we can with the best ratio between glass and frame. So even just on this one little facade that faces south, on these four windows, if you were to break them into eight windows, just a little bit more frame per window, you can see that the 5.6 annual heat demand of kilo BTUs per square foot per year that we certified goes all the way up to 5.98, almost six kilo BTUs per square foot per year. And this is just one tiny array um, but again, it's, it's sort of that challenge of small buildings and how sensitive they are to um, the window layout. This is our window detail. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. We do tend to adjust it depending on what builder we're working with for um, the work we're doing now. Although we do always suggest we over insulate the frames. Um, you know, no matter how good the window uh, you buy, uh, you're still going to have the frame that's holding it, uh, which is a weakness in the, in the whole assembly. So we sometimes vary between the backer rod or the expanding uh, foam tape that you can stick on there and it expands over a few hours. But we do generally have a detail faintly similar to this one. Here's the radiant performance of this window design. And you can see that that, that over framing is making a really big difference. This is another detail we include in a lot of our passive houses that I'm fond of. And that's instead of, um, you know, creating entirely false ceilings, which I feel like we did a lot more in the beginning in our early work. Uh, we use the truss bays and then really cleverly little soffited details to run all the HRV ducting for the house. So we're not going to pay for a whole second ceiling. 
Um, and the way we do that is we just step into the trust bay either with a hard lid like OSB or you can use, um, you know, Intello and other membranes, things of that nature too, to do this sort of thing. But you can really just displace very, very, very little um, insulation and really create a nice chase way for yourself to do some of that, that forward thinking, some of that planning. Here's some finished photos of the house. It was very well accepted by the neighborhood, which is always, like I said, challenging in an existing culture, tight-knit community like that. The bike bedroom doing its job. This home was featured in uh, the Downsize book by Sherry Coons, her most recent, recent book. And not only did she feature this home, but also the home, um, another passive house that we did in Port Townsend. So it's pretty cool that there's I think there's even more, I'm trying to remember, but there's several passive houses um, in the book, which is, I imagine why Lloyd so graciously wrote some quotes on the back of it. And uh, yeah, Sherry Coons is a really wonderful um, author and we were really honored to be featured in her book about downsizing. These are the clients, they're absolutely lovely. It's the best part of my job, is getting to work with wonderful people. And, oh, also notice that little porch detail we talked about was a great place to put the steel um, L brackets to hold up that floating uh, bench that they wanted. So that didn't have to be a thermal bridge because of that little faux uh, deeper rain screen detail that we did. So that's really the end of my case study, uh, but I'm just gonna throw a few more things at the end here. Um, I think a lot of people that are in, this group are practicing professionals and I think we're all dealing with, um, you know, how to pivot our firms and how to keep them relevant during COVID and trying to um, think smarter and not harder. So my firm applied uh, for the PPP funding, um, which we did receive for the next eight weeks. Um, God help us. And uh, we are using it to fund the development of some passive house uh, uh, plan sets that you can just buy online. So we uh, have been pushing pretty hard on this for a few weeks and we hope to get it live pretty quickly, but we're gonna have a lot of options. So we're gonna have some um, really cool, uh, you know, prefab designs. We're gonna be uh, working with Collective Carpentry to have some, so they can be ready with pricing and things like that. We're gonna have um, duplexes, some passive house duplexes or townhouses that we've designed. We've been working with Habitat for Humanity and we've taken those designs and pushed them a little bit further into the passive home realm and we're going to have those plan sets ready for developers to buy. We have some uh, prefab ADUs that are some really lovely designs. Um, I'm hoping to talk Zach into putting one in his backyard. <laughs> so we're working on that. And then um, we're also going to have some uh, passive house uh, ADUs that are smaller and more modest, um, more cost effective. Uh, because we do um, really believe in, in density and that's, that's a great, um, a very small but great way that, that cities can start to take steps towards that. So we'll have lots of fun, modern, above garage, slab, lots of different passive house options. Um, and we're pretty excited for people to uh, be able to easily purchase them. Um, and then we can, you know, always facilitate um, permitting and you know what else people need, but we'd really love for these to be accessible products to um, the general public. So one thing I will say is when we get to discussion, it would be great to get feedback from people about, especially such a great group of professionals about what something like this should cost. That's been really heavily debated in the office. You know, there's definitely the standpoint of we want people to be able to afford them. And then there's also that point where um, devaluing your work doesn't help your industry. So we are having those discussions and I would love any feedback about that. So that'll be going live soon. Um, the amazing Rusa Cassell is heading that up. And with that, that is my presentation and I will stop sharing.